does Lafayette fit into this whole thing? He, he doesn't. Uh, his father was fighting in the French army on the continent, and he was killed in one of the battles against Frederick, uh, Dedingen or Rosbach, I've forgotten which one. So uh, Lafayette grew up as a young man. He was a, a commissioned officer because he was from a military family, and his father had bought him a commission. He grew up uh, learning military arts and with a great hatred for the British because they were responsible, he felt, for the death of his father. Uh, but he was not in North America during the French and Indian War. Thank you. Yes, sir. You, you said that the uh, French gave up after that seven-year war and did all, their, all rights to territory in North America. Well, how did we manage to buy the Louisiana Territory from the well, that's, that's a, a, another story, but an interesting one. Uh, Louisiana was west of the Mississippi, yeah. and that was claimed by France, but nobody knew what was there except for New Orleans. And, and the French, in order to compensate their allies, the Spanish, gave the Spanish New Orleans after the French and Indian War, and the Spanish had to give the English Florida, and there was a big debate about where Florida even extended to. They, the Spanish claimed much of Georgia and Alabama uh, and Mississippi as being part of it. Then uh, what happens is Napoleon comes along after the French Revolution, and he is interested in Louisiana as a bread basket, really a rice basket, to, to raise food to support his people in the Sugar Islands, um, notably Haiti, as well as, as, well as um, the Guadeloupe and Martinique. However, the uh, slave insurrection in Haiti, led by uh, Overture of Toussaint, um, overthrew the French, killed most of them, whereupon Napoleon learned that the, the people he was raising rice for in Louisiana were all dead. Uh, he sent an army under his brother over there to reconquer Haiti, and they all came down with uh, yellow fever, and most of them died. So Napoleon said, a pox on these guys. I'm busy in Europe. Uh, and at about that time, uh, James Monroe shows up as an agent of his friend Tom Jefferson to buy New Orleans. And Napoleon says, well, why stop there? I don't know how big it is, but you're going to have all of Louisiana for $15 million. And so Jefferson said, sold. So it's kind of a complicated land swap that goes back and forth. Interestingly enough, the British never recognized the Louisiana Purchase. Um, the Battle of New Orleans is a little outside of our scope of our discussion, but the Battle of New Orleans was fought after peace had been declared in the War of 1812. But if Andy Jackson had been on the losing side, there's no way the British were going to give it back. They claimed that Napoleon stole Louisiana from the Spanish, who claimed it. And that, therefore, under the legal principle that a thief cannot convey title to something that he stole, the, the whole Louisiana Purchase was null and void. So, again, had Andy Jackson lost, we would not have Louisiana today. But the, the, the Spanish, of course, claimed it because they had Texas and Mexico and all of that country down that way. So a lot of complicated stories here. Um, but um, that's what makes history fun. Yes, sir. Uh, it's interesting that it's interesting that after the, the, the conflict was concluded, both Eastern Canada and the Eastern United States, when the conflict was over, we spoke English, but French was <laughs> language in, in Canada. Well, in Quebec, um, there were two parts of Canada in, in, in those the, days. That was Canada, Quebec. Well, the, the, the Quebec and Ontario. Uh, Quebec was Lower Canada, and Ontario was Upper Canada. And the difference is above and below Niagara Falls. Everything below Niagara Falls was Lower Canada, therefore Quebec. Everything above Niagara Falls was Ontario. And, and that's really where the French were. But as I mentioned in that one map, they also were down the Mississippi uh, and, of course, had a foothold in, in Louisiana. Um, so. And the amazing thing to me is how the French got around through all of this territory. Uh, again, it's a little off subject, but um, I'm the governor of the Michigan Society of Colonial Wars, and we help uh, support the archaeological work at Fort St. Joseph in Niles. If you ever get a chance, you might want to wander over there. 
Uh, Fort St. Joseph was built by the French in 1691 to cover the portage between the St. Joseph and Kankakee Rivers. And I said, well, so what? Well, the French had discovered, and this is 1691, and they didn't have any uh, GPS systems or anything. Uh, they had discovered an all-water route from Quebec to New Orleans with just a couple of portages. They went from Quebec up the St. Lawrence to Lake Ontario, the length of Lake Ontario uh, to uh, the Niagara River, up, up the Niagara River around the falls uh, to Lake Erie, up Lake Erie to the Detroit River, up the Detroit River uh, to uh, Lake St. Clair, across Lake St. Clair, up the St. Clair River to Lake Huron, all the way around Lake Huron to the Straits, and all the way down Lake Michigan to the St. Joseph River, up the St. Joseph River to Niles, which wasn't Niles in those days, Portage to the Kankakee, then down the Kankakee to the Illinois, down the Illinois to the Mississippi, and down the Mississippi to New Orleans. Now, how in the heck did they figure that out? I don't think with GPS and modern maps I could have figured that out. And yet they did this in 1691. Um, so, I mean, it's amazing the stuff that these people accomplished uh, with uh, resources that are extremely sparse and very limited. So, uh, anybody else? Questions, comments, brickbats, insults? Yes, sir. Did the Cajun people wind up in Louisiana? Yes. Um, this, I kind of skipped over it. Uh, Fort Bassador was captured in 1755, and this area around here was Acadia. In fact, as you can see it right on the map there. Um, the Acadians were French. They were French farmers. Uh, but the British were concerned that if they left them there, they would provide aid and comfort to the French, and the French might get back in. So the British got the bright idea of packing up the Acadians and removing them forcibly from their farms and lands and redeposited them down in Louisiana. Uh, and that's where the, the word Cajun comes from, Acadian. Uh, they were originally Canadians, and, and now they live in the bayous. And it was, it was actually um, one of the first examples in modern history of ethnic cleansing. Um, you know, not a very nice thing. Yes, sir? How did, how did Washington stand out? How did he become, how did he become the American general? And how did, what did he do during the British War? Well, mostly he got beaten. Um, he, <laughs> He, uh, he tried to kick the French out, as I mentioned, and they didn't go. And uh, then he, he attacked a French delegation um, and killed a bunch of Frenchmen. And then they came and captured him in Fort uh, Necessity uh, and sent him packing back to Virginia. Uh, he then, for the rest of the war, uh, commanded the 1st Virginia Regiment, which was stationed primarily in Winchester, in what was then the western frontier of Virginia. Uh, to protect the frontier settlements in Virginia against Indian attacks. Um, he then eventually tired of the military life. His older brother died and left him uh, a nice estate on the Potomac called Mount Vernon, yeah. named after a British admiral under whom Lawrence Washington had served in one of the prior wars. Um, and Washington then very prudently married the wealthiest widow in Virginia. <coughs> Uh, Martha Custis, uh, who brought a huge fortune with her, and he decided to become a Virginia gentleman of the first order, served in the House of Burgesses, uh, was politically active, socially active, and when the Continental Congress met in Philadelphia on the eve of the American Revolution, uh, he was in the habit of wearing his Virginia militia colonel's uniform. And when the delegates to the Congress had to select a commander in chief for the army, uh, the only guy in the room with a uniform <laughs> was George Washington. He also was a very imposing man. He was over six feet tall, very powerfully built. Uh, one of his favorite tricks was he used to be able to take a walnut and crush it between his index finger and thumb. And he would do this at various taverns in Williamsburg after taking bets from people that he couldn't do it. And uh, it was one of his favorite tricks. Um, he's also said to have thrown a dollar across the, not the Potomac, the Rappahannock, uh, which is not an impossible thing to do in, in the area around Fredericksburg. But, so he was, uh, he was politically imposing. He was wealthy. 
uh, a person of considerable prominence, and of course did have a lot of wartime experience in the French and Indian War. So, and they didn't really have a whole lot of uh, general material in the Congress. They had a lot of officers out in the hinterland, but they weren't serving in Congress, which kind of was the key to his uh, getting appointed. Good question, though. And of course, militarily, he was, for the most part, not the most impressive general. Uh, even in the Revolutionary War, his main achievement was keeping an army in the field. Uh, a lesser man would have lost the support of his troops and, and the army would have fallen apart. But he kept it together, uh, scored a couple of victories, although quite a number of losses, uh, and ultimately managed to win. And of course, uh, to pick up a theme that I ended on, the French, who were looking for revenge for their loss to the British in the French and Indian War, the Seven Years' War, of course, became allies of the Americans in the American Revolution. Not because they were much fans of democracy uh, or people going after their king, uh, but they just wanted to get even with the English. <laughs> and they, of course, supplied most of the material and a majority of the men in the final campaign of the revolution at Yorktown. Uh, Washington's army was about uh, 6,000 Americans and eight or 10,000 French. Uh, and all the artillery uh, that was used was landed from French warships. 24-pounder siege guns and 13-inch uh, uh, mortars. I, I, I thought that Washington kind of helped uh, bring the British Army back from Braddock's defeat. Uh, he did. Braddock lost, killed. But, uh, Braddock was killed. Many of the, uh, of the officers in the British Army were killed. Uh, and Washington was an aide-de-camp uh, to Braddock, uh, and he kind of took over, really, and did get the British Army out of there. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the British High Command decided to fall all the way back to Philadelphia and go into winter quarters, and it was like the beginning of August. So, I mean, that left the whole frontier of Pennsylvania open. And Pennsylvania, unlike the other colonies, did not have an active militia organization. Why? Who dominated the Pennsylvania Assembly? Quakers. And what, what did Quakers not want to do? Fight. They would not organize a militia. And so the Indians overran about three quarters of Pennsylvania after Braddock's defeat. And it was a while before they got chased out of there. Uh, other questions, comments? Yes, sir. They do. And I think Highway 